Good morning, everyone. So please turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're back in 2 Thessalonians 2, and today we're going to work through verses 9 through 12. And while you're turning there, I'll do a quick recap of where we went through last week. Uh, Last week, we were continuing to talk about the Antichrist, and we talked about the timing of when he was going to be revealed and how God was managing that timing through the restraining work of the Holy Spirit. And then we ended things with verse 8 that affirmed that even though the restraining force would be removed uh, and the Antichrist would be revealed and he would go on to do his thing, Uh, Verse 8 shows us the limitation for what he was going to do. It's going to show the boundaries of those future events because Jesus is going to confront him and and destroy him. So that's a future event prophecy foretold like the other prophecies we've been working through about the day of the Lord. And today we're going to continue our our look at the Antichrist. Uh, And the focus now, though, is really going to be on how he works what his methods are going to be, and by extension, how Satan works and what methods he uses, because Paul tells us they are one and the same. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll jump in. Let's start reading verses 9 through 10. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie, In all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. So our key concept this morning, what we're going through is right here in verse 9 where it says the Antichrist comes in accordance with how Satan works. So what do we take away from that? What does Paul mean here? Well, We know that Satan is also called the father of lies. He's the counterfeiter of truth. And in Sunday school, we've been working through the Truth Project, and I've never um, gone through that before. Personally, I'd heard good things about it, so I was excited that we're going through it here. And, And by the way, as a plug, if you've not been here... It would be worth your time, I think, to come. It's, it's been very good, and uh, this video series is one where it seems like you can jump in, uh, you know, even if you hadn't been there in the beginning. But anyway, uh, the, the whole core premise, it seems, for, this, uh, for the Truth Project comes down to John 18.37. And in John 18.37, Jesus said, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So this is Jesus himself in the Bible telling us what his purpose is. He came to testify to the truth. And if we line that up with a few other passages of Scripture, a very important picture develops. John 14, 6, this is also Jesus talking. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus came to testify to the truth. Jesus is the truth. And John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So if Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is also the Word, then the Word of God must also be the truth. That's the transitive law in action, right? If A equals B and B equals C, then A must equal C. So if Jesus and the Bible are truth and Satan is against God, he obviously must be against truth. And that's why the Bible calls him the father of lies, because that's what he does. That's how he works. And so the Truth Project is uh, really bringing this idea out. And uh, one of the things that it said in the video in the first installment is that it said, you don't even have to really go out into the world to determine what the worldly position is on anything. It said, all you have to do is imagine a biblical concept Figure out what the opposite of that is, and there's your worldly position. And it's kind of funny, it sounds like a joke, but uh, really not making a joke. In the video, they put a chart on the screen, and they worked through a number of different examples of this. They had the godly positions on the left side, and then all the worldly positions, the correlating worldly positions on the right, and it was completely the opposite every single time. And this shouldn't be shocking, right? Because when you think about it, 
uh, if you consider there's, there's been this just giant spiritual battle going on since the creation of the world, and that battle's literally between the truth, and that's truth with a capital T, and the father of lies. And so we see a great example of this here in verses 9 and 10 of our passage today. The Antichrist will deceive uh, through... He will deceive through uh, counterfeit works. He's going to uh, work through deception. And uh, so I want to spend just a few moments here uh, working through uh, exactly what that looks like and, and fleshing that out to make sure we, we've got the, the, the proper application here. So verses 9 through 10 says, The Antichrist will arrive in the same way that Satan works. Right? And uh, that's, that's verse 9. It explains that at the core there's a lie. Right at the core of what Antichrist is doing, there is a lie. In the beginning of verse 10, it says there, the lie is supported by deception. So we've got a lie there is, that is supported by deception, and the end of verse 9 kind of sets up verse 10 by explaining that deception is going to be powerful. It lists out there's displays of power, there's signs, there's wonders, these are miracles or counterfeit miracles that all serve to advance the lie. And this is exactly how Satan works. And this makes sense, right? Because Paul's whole point, the Antichrist, is going to engage in the same kind of tactics that Satan does. And it works. Two weeks ago, when we posted a midweek message, it was about uh, whether the beast and the Antichrist were the same person. And we said, yes, they are the same person. But we also noted in that video that uh, that concept that they're the same really isn't all that terribly interesting. It's just fact. They're the same person. But the interesting part, the whole point of the video was why those two names are apropos. And that's a, the interesting angle to the story. And I won't spoil that for you if you hadn't gotten around to watching the video yet. But in supporting that or in building to the conclusion we were working on there, one of the things that we had to unpack involved how Satan works. And so this is the same angle that we're looking at this morning, and that is Satan is a deceiver. This is a really important enough topic that I think it deserves its own point. If we are in a spiritual war, and we are, by the way, then we need to be able to recognize our enemy. This is something that we often fall short on here for a few, for a few reasons. One, I think that partly it's because our culture uh, paints the wrong picture of what's going on and we buy into that. We also fall short in our understanding here sometimes just due to intellectual laziness. We don't think about the spiritual war going on around us enough oftentimes. And third, uh, part of it may be too because uh, we haven't really studied our Bible specifically looking for this and gaining an understanding of these particular types of things. So I want to work through this a little bit and then we'll tie it back to uh, 2 Thessalonians 2. We can miss Satan's attacks because he has convinced our culture that he is something else. And by extension, we rely on our culture uh, to educate us on Satan and, and his activities, and when we rely on that, then we can be deceived too. When I was a kid, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I've shared that with you guys before, but uh, when I was a kid, the television taught me that Satan is this red guy with a tail, and he always had a pitchfork for some reason and maybe anger issues, and the two things that I learned about him were, one, he was in charge of this fiery place called hell, and I was taught that, uh, you know, if you're really bad, like really, really bad, then when you die, you'll be sent there and, and you'll be punished by him. And then the second thing uh, that I was taught about this was that while you were alive, all of us had this opportunity at any given time to make a deal with Satan. And, and if we did that, then, then you'd get some kind of extraordinary power or, or some huge blessing. But in return, you had to send him your soul, right? And so the result was that when you died, you'd go to hell no matter what, unless George Burns got involved somehow or, or some other such nonsense. If you <laughs> grew up when I did, you know what I'm talking about. But the point here is... This picture that popular culture had painted is completely false, right? The Bible tells us Satan doesn't look anything like this at all. It says he's an angel, and the Bible says actually he's beautiful. 
It also says he's not in charge of hell. He is the prince of this world. He is in charge of this place right now. And his job is not to punish the bad people. He's trying to take over. And further, this idea that you can sell your soul to the devil is just utter nonsense. Satan doesn't need to offer us anything spectacular for us to rebel. We do that on our own, every single one of us. Now, that was the picture of Satan when I was a kid, right? And as my wife increasingly points out these days, when I was a kid, that time was a really, really long time ago. And things have changed, right? Things have moved on. And interestingly, our culture's depiction of Satan has changed too. And it's actually gotten a little more accurate in some respects. Uh, but I think these changes in how Satan is depicted is all because the deception has changed, before, Satan's deception was to turn himself into a character, into a cartoon character, uh, so that nobody would take him seriously. But now he's moved on. He's no longer a caricature for us to disregard. He's now the cool guy. He's almost a role model now. And people sympathize with him now. And I think that's because Satan has done such a good job of perverting our culture. When right is wrong and wrong is right and nothing is evil as long as it's right for you, when you make that your mantra, when Satan's deception becomes your value system, then this guy starts to look pretty normal now, doesn't he? Now, I've never actually watched this particular show, so it might be off in my pictorial example here a little bit, but directionally where our culture has gone, I think we're on target. Satan has just become normal for us. We're so used to seeing him around everywhere that we kind of like him, but he tells us the things that we want to hear. So this is how he appears in our culture today. And let me tell you, that is a very, very scary narrative right there. We are so used to seeing the father of lies at work around us that we just turn him into the ironic good guy character now in TVs and movies. We as a people have collectively lost our minds. Why else do we think the world is in such a mess right now? As a people, we have, brought, we have bought into this deception that Satan has been peddling for 6,000 years. And so we cannot miss what Paul is trying to tell us here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Antichrist fights like Satan does. They are both very, very powerful. And sometimes they move armies, sometimes they project their power directly, but usually when Satan comes at us, it doesn't look like this. This is how most of us picture it, right? This big evil uh, uh, creature coming and attacking us directly, but when he comes at us, it usually doesn't look like this. It usually looks more like this. Maybe it looks like this. Sometimes it looks like this. Unfortunately, a lot of times... It looks like this. The Antichrist is a deceiver. Satan is the great deceiver. This is what Paul is trying to tell us here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Antichrist is not going to rise to power using a full frontal assault, letting everyone know his true nature. He's going to rise to power through deception, through trickery, and lies. And I think the climax of this deception is shown in Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation 13, we see Antichrist holding himself up as a counterfeit Jesus. He's apparently killed, he suffers some kind of fatal wound, but then he comes back from the dead, and the Bible says that because of this, his death and his apparent resurrection, the false prophet makes everyone worship him. It sounds familiar, right? He's trying to steal Jesus' position. He is a hollow, evil imitation of our Savior, but people buy into the lie. We talked about this event a fair amount in last week's message, so I won't go over it again, but uh, this is more of the parallel between the methods of the Antichrist and Satan. Their, their work is all about imitating and bastardizing the work of God. Just as Antichrist is a false Christ, Satan also sets himself up as a counterfeit God. And when we read through the rest of the Bible, you can kind of connect up some of these dots. The picture is very, very clear. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, that he has planted false believers in the church. And in that passage, Paul said, 
He had to be constantly on the move because he was in danger. His life was in danger from, among other things, these false believers in the church. These people who would normally pass as sons and daughters of God were trying to kill Paul for delivering the message of the gospel. These were false believers. Then there are false believers at work today who will worship with you. These people will pray with you. They will befriend you. And at the right time, Satan will use them to accomplish some wicked thing to strike against God. 2 Corinthians 11.13, it says that Satan has also planted false ministers in the church. It's bad enough we've got counterfeit believers in the church, but apparently there's counterfeit pastors too. And we studied through this when we worked through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the book of Jude. False teachers who were leading the church astray. John called them wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul says these men are imposters. I guess men and women who are doing this today are imposters. Paul also talks about the fact that these false uh, preachers and false ministers preach a false gospel. We can read about that in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. It says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul talked about that same phenomenon at the, book of, at the beginning of 2 Thessalonians. We talked about that a few weeks ago, right? Apparently, some people had forged a letter supposedly coming from him, and it was leading the church astray on matters of eschatology. Paul says those counterfeit Christians have a counterfeit righteousness. That's Romans 10, 1 to 3, and Philippians 3, 4 to 10. And in Matthew 7, 15 to 29, we see that these false Christians also have a false assurance of salvation. So these points are, are scattered throughout the Bible, but when we put them all together, what Paul is telling us here makes a whole world of sense about the Antichrist coming in accordance with how Satan works. Right here, we have Satan producing false churches. There are false believers in good churches. There are false pastors in both. There are false pastors and teachers preaching a counterfeit gospel. Right? The counterfeit believers have a counterfeit righteousness and a counterfeit assurance of salvation. Is it any wonder then that the Antichrist should show up performing miracles and signs and wonders and then die and rise from the dead? Is it any wonder then that the prince of this world has also been counterfeiting morality and virtue? What was evil is now good. And recognizing that formal evil as good is now virtuous. We need to know how the Antichrist is going to ascend to power, but also we can't be fooled in thinking that Satan always comes at us in a frontal assault because most of the time it's sneaky. Most of the time it's deceitful. Most of the time it's nasty. And all of that sinfulness appears and occurs beneath the veneer of something that could almost look like it comes out of this book. That's what Paul tells us. That's how our enemy works. So Satan is a deceiver. The Antichrist comes in accordance with how Satan works. And so what happens? We're going to read verse 10 again, and then we'll go ahead and read through verse 12. In all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. This passage here is really, really important because, A, it gives us some more information about the Antichrist, which is good information to know, but, B, this also helps to clear up one of the biggest misconceptions that the world has about God. In reading these words, we can see here very, very clearly that God is not cruel. When I've talked to non-Christians about God in the Bible over the years, one of the biggest objections that I run into, one of the biggest stumbling blocks that folks seems to have or seem to have is accepting what the Bible has to say uh, because of this notion that they have that God is fine with some people going to heaven and some people going to hell. 
I have heard that time and time again. Tim, I just cannot accept a God who would sentence people to an eternity of suffering. And I kind of get it on one hand. Hell is a, just a terrible thing to contemplate. I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go there. Right? But, but we can't let the emotionalism of this terrible thing cloud our thinking. So to address this objection, we have to consider a couple of things. One, if you are shopping around for a God that you think you like the sound of, you're doing it wrong. Right? Our, our quest to learn about who God is, is is not a process of interviewing gods for the job. We have to understand our perception of who God is does not create God. He is real whether we understand Him. He is real whether we like Him or not. And if we close our eyes because we don't like some aspect of theology or don't like this particular thing that we see in the Bible, that does not make Him go away. So we first got to put our feelings aside when we're investigating the truth of the Bible. Whether God turns out to be who you hoped He was or not, that has absolutely no impact on His existence whatsoever. And two, when you read through the book, it becomes absolutely clear here that it is not a cruel God who sends us to hell. We have earned that ticket all on our own. This is the basic message of the gospel. Romans 3.23, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So as much as God is a God of love, He is also a God of justice. We have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, myself included. That is all of us. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. This is talking about a, a spiritual death. So apparently all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all of us have earned the sentencing of going to hell on our own. God is anything but cruel in sending us there. In fact, not only do, do we not want to go there, the Bible is clear, God doesn't want us to go there either. And because He feels so strongly about that, He sent His Son to die on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. The Bible says that He is not willing that any should perish. No one has done more to help us out and help us to avoid the possibility of hell than God has. But the problem is, many people, most people, reject this free gift that God has given us. So given all that, here's the position of the unsaved. They've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And again, I'm not judging. I was this way too. They have earned death through their sin. God sent them a Savior in the most widely attested to, most widely written about, most well-known event in the history of the world. And most people hear that and they say, no thanks. And our passage in 2 Thessalonians today gives us a peek into that. Look at what it says right here in verse 10. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. And then in verse 11 it says, For this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Notice the order here. This is very important. The condemned people, the passage is talking about, they have already experienced Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. They have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, and they have earned death. But God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son so that whosoever should believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. That's John 3.16. But in spite of all of that, 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says, They perish because they refused to love the truth and be saved. And because of this, God gives them over to this delusion that they don't come back from. This is not God being cruel. Understand this. This is actually God giving them what they want. After He offered His free gift, they have refused that. They have refused to love the truth. Their actions have told God that they don't want Him or His plans at all. They have chosen their own sin over a Savior. We're not talking about people who've never heard the gospel. We're talking about everyone who has heard the gospel but has refused to act on it. That's the vast majority of the people in the world, by the way. And keep in mind the timing here. Last week we talked about how the Bible says that one of the reasons that things are dragging on so long is, uh, before Jesus comes back is that God knows everyone in the world who would or will accept His offer of salvation and He is waiting for every single one of those people to do so. 
And once that's done, once everybody who, comes, who would come to know uh, the saving knowledge of Christ does so, then 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 happens. Everybody left. Everybody left has heard the message of the gospel and said, no thank you. And God knows that position will not change. They have said, I don't need Jesus. I'm going to follow this other guy. And God knows, again, at that point, not one of them will change. And so he gives them what they want. They want to reject God and follow Satan. He says, done. God gives them over to the delusion. And listen, maybe they just can't accept who they is, who he is. So they pretend he doesn't exist. Maybe they're mad at him. I don't know. Everybody's got a reason. There's a lot of different reasons. But if you are trying to process the idea of eternal damnation emotionally, we have to keep in mind this reality is not playing out emotionally. It plays out in the Bible rationally and truthfully. Do not let your feelings distract you from the truth. Because the fact of the matter is, once we can see beyond the reality of our feelings, the truth of who God really is, is more powerful than anything we could have come up with on our own. It's better than anything we could have come up with on our own. So we're going to end here. And I hate to wrap up uh, this morning on a down note, but uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll, we'll get together. Next week, we'll probably look at a topical message on thankfulness to get ready for Thanksgiving. Uh, but then if we can meet together the week after that, we'll continue with the rest of chapter 2. And we see the contrast between this condemnation and those who are willing to, to accept Christ as their Savior. And we'll see then that uh, this contrast is going to be absolutely optimistic and it's going to be filled with hope. And it is an absolutely beautiful thing. Would you close with me in prayer, and then we'll uh, take communion together as a family, and then uh, we'll sing our final hymn, and we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord, we thank you so very much for giving us this time together. We thank you for loving us, and we thank you for giving us your word. And Lord, we ask that you would please give us wisdom from the things that we have talked about. I know the Bible here is talking about future events, and for uh, those who know you and, and have made Jesus their, their Savior, Lord, we know that the Bible promises we won't even be around to see these things unfold, but we thank you for what they teach us anyway. Thank you for the principles we've learned from them and the insight and reminders that we've been given about how Satan attacks us now. And uh, Lord, we ask that you would give us wisdom about these things and help us to be able to uh, grow and, and become better sons and daughters to you as a result. We love you so very much, Father, and we thank you again for, for taking such good care of us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to ask uh, our men to come forward here.